This is a video all about incredible finds. They could be scientific, archaeological, paleontological, or something else entirely. They could be large or small. They could be ancient or modern. The only thing that matters is that they're incredible. So we've weeded out anything that doesn't fit the bill and made sure that this is a video full of pure wonder. We begin with the Codex Tovar, which is one of the best preserved Mesoamerican manuscripts still in existence. It was written by the Jesuit devotee Juan de Tovar in the 16th century, and then illustrated by Aztec painters. Despite its cartoonish style, it's a very serious and hugely important document. Its full name is Historia de la Benita de los Inidos a Poblar a México de las Partes Remotas de Occidente, which translates into English as the history of the arrival of the Indians to populate Mexico from the remote regions of the West. It's not a name that exactly trips off the tongue, but it's an accurate description of the contents of the Codex. There are strong similarities between the Codex Tovar and the Ramirez Codex, although the two texts aren't completely identical. It's thought that de Tovar derived much of his work from an earlier work by Diego Duran known as Chronica X. But this earlier text has long since been lost or destroyed, so it's impossible to verify the theory. The circumstances in which the Codex was written mean that it's likely to be a biased telling of the story, but a very complete one nonetheless. Here's another fascinating ancient document. It's the Apur Papyrus, which was created during the 19th dynasty era of ancient Egypt some 3200 years ago. It's a unique document because rather than being a declaration, proclamation, or legal record, the Apur Papyrus is a poem. Apur, a man, complains about changes in the world around him, including a woman who owned nothing being given a box. A woman who used to have to look in the water to see her reflection now owning a mirror, and his formerly rich friend now living in rags. He accuses the gods of neglecting their duties and observes that even the king's burial inside a pyramid has been desecrated. Unfortunately, we don't know how the poem ends because the final piece of the papyrus is missing. Descriptions of a river of blood in the text, along with references to servants fleeing for their lives, have been taken by some as confirmation of the veracity of the book of Exodus. However, most scholars agree that making any such connection is quite a leap. As for the account of the king's tomb and the pyramid being desecrated, the king is never named, so the claim can't be verified. We're not done with ancient texts yet. Next up, we have the Gorton Code, sometimes referred to as the Great Code. It's a code of laws and formed the basis of civil law in the ancient Greek city-state of Gorton in what's now Crete. All we know of the code is the surviving passages of it inscribed on the walls of what was once the ancient city's agora. Even in its diminished state, it's the longest ancient Greek inscription in existence, save for the Diogenes of Oneadna. Based on the style of the inscription, experts believe it to have been etched by one person working alone. It's approximately 2,500 years old. Matters covered within the code include the procedure for bringing a lawsuit, protections for the accused, punishments for adultery and sexual offenses, and inheritance laws. Most crimes covered by the inscription are punishable by way of fines, effectively meaning that the laws may as well not exist for Gorton's richest residents. Interestingly, it seems that only men were punished for adultery, with no defined punishment for adulterous women. In 1978, a combined team of Afghan and Soviet archaeologists opened a burial mound in Shebergan, Afghanistan. The mound is known as the Tilyatepa, which translates into English as Golden Mound. That's a fair summary of what the archaeologists found inside the mound. The incredibly rich tomb contained more than 20,000 artifacts, most of which were made of gold, but some of which were made of other precious materials like silver and ivory. In among all the treasures were the remains of five women and one man, the identities of whom will probably never be known. Collectively, the Tilyatepa treasure hoard is now known as the Bactrian Gold. Highlights from the collection include golden necklaces, medallions, belts inlaid with precious stones, 
and a stunning crown which came from the burial of one of the women. We can safely assume her to have been a queen. The entire hoard went missing during the Afghanistan War of the early 21st century but was recovered in 2003. It's now in a secure location, waiting for a new purpose-built museum in Kabul to open, within which it will be the main attraction. If you know anything about the island of Taiwan, you can probably picture what a typical Taiwanese person looks like. In October 2022, we found out that what the average Taiwanese person looks like now has absolutely nothing in common with what the average Taiwanese person looked like 6,000 years ago. Scientists have been studying the skull of a woman who was found in a cave on the island and concluded that she would have been short in stature and her skin would have been dark. Her DNA resembles that of ancient samples collected in Africa, and her cranial features have aspects in common with those of the Negritos of South Africa and the Philippines. This is the first solid physical evidence that folk legends of the indigenous tribes of Taiwan might be true. The legends have always spoken of short, dark people who lived in the mountains and had been there for thousands of years before the tribes themselves arrived. The oldest of the tribes has a history that dates back 4,800 years, so whoever this woman was, she belonged to a race that predates the tribes by at least 1,200 years. Now that we've seemingly proven that these people were here, the next question to answer is where they went. Being an archaeologist sometimes means putting yourself in places other people would go out of their way to avoid. A perfect example came in October 2000 when a team of archaeologists in Cambridge, England lowered themselves into a sewerage shaft to see if anything interesting was hiding beneath Chesterton Lane in the city. It was dirty work, but they got their reward in the shape of the Chesterton Lane coin hoard. All of these coins were minted between the 13th and 14th centuries and were found inside the semi-disintegrated remains of a wooden box in what was once the bottom floor of a house. There are 1,805 silver pennies in the hoard, plus nine gold coins. This would have been a substantial sum of money in the medieval era and probably represents somebody's life savings. It's likely that the money was hidden in the aftermath of the Black Death. The evidence suggests that after being put in the box, the money was placed inside a hole dug in the ground and then sealed with a stone before being topped with a layer of clay flooring. We'll never know why the treasure owner never came back for it. Our next discovery isn't a single treasure or artifact, it's a whole category of artifacts. This is a Sisi, also sometimes known as a Yuan Bao. A Sisi is usually a gold ingot although silver ingots are sometimes known as Sisi too. This is the way that gold ingots were created in Imperial China from the beginning of the Xin Dynasty 2200 years ago right through the end of the Xing Dynasty in the early 20th century. Rather than being made by the country's central bank, which didn't exist back in those early years, Sisi were traditionally made by gold or silversmiths and then used in their local markets. As a result, the size, shape, and additional details on each Sisi might vary considerably from location to location. Most surviving ancient Sisi are boat-shaped, but there are also some shaped like flowers, loaves, squares, ovals, and even more elaborate shapes like tortoises. Determining the value of each Sisi was the job of a professional money handler known as a shrove who would evaluate the purity and weight of the gold or silver and assign a value accordingly. If you're thinking that such a system would be wide open to bias and fraud, you'd be absolutely right. Dolavira in India is sometimes referred to as the settlement with the world's oldest signboard. It was settled by the Harappan civilization and is also home to what might be the world's first storage system. Every time monsoon season arrives, water spills into two channels that take it to Mansur in the north and Manhar in the south. The signboard we refer to consists of 10 inscribed symbols left behind by the Indus Valley Civilization around 5,000 years ago. The symbols have never been deciphered, but archaeologists are reasonably sure that the stone board was once hung on a wooden plank in front of the door to a building. 
Aside from those points of interest, historians admire Dolavira for its incredibly well-organized streets and urban layout, with clearly identifiable areas for administration, industrial activity, and private dwellings surrounding a central fortified citadel. Nobody knows what caused the inhabitants of Dolavira to move away around 3,800 years ago, but it might have been due to a decrease in sea level, leaving the land dry and arid. After that abandonment, the city was buried by wind and sand for thousands of years before eventually being rediscovered in 1956. The Orkney Islands can be found to the north of Scotland and are part of the British Isles. One of the Orkney Islands is called Papa Westre, and off the coast of Papa Westre is an even smaller island called Home of Pape. This is where the prehistoric residents of a settlement known as Knapp of Hoar buried their dead 5,000 years ago. There are actually three different ancient burial cairns on the home of Pape, all of which are of the Mashoi type. The tombs were first opened and explored in the 19th century, but were then largely forgotten about until 2009 when a tiny stone figurine was found by archaeologists from historic Scotland. The features of the figurine are distinctive and unique, including big, bushy eyebrows and tiny dotted eyes. The features of the figurine are similar to those seen on carvings inside the entrance to the largest of the island's tombs. Images of people from this era are rare on the British mainland, but attitudes to artistic representations of the human form appear to have been different on these tiny remote islands. The island is uninhabited by humans today, but the seals who live there are known to be friendly to visitors. The country we know today as Ireland has been steadily populated by human beings for several thousand years and is covered in ancient monuments. Rock tombs are a common sight on the Emerald Isles, and of those rock tombs, the Labakale Wedge Tomb in Glanworth County, Cork is probably the most significant. It's the largest wedge tomb in the country, and also among the oldest, with an approximate age of 4,300 years. The name Labakale translates as Hag's Bed, which is a description of the tomb's unusual shape. A 1934 archaeological survey revealed that the tomb had been used not just once but several times, with burials going all the way back to the Stone Age and Stone Age relics, including tools and bones successfully recovered from the site. The folklore of the area associates the tomb with the Celtic hag goddess Kaliak Bur, a weather deity sometimes known as the Queen of Winter, who's said to be buried there. That caused a lot of excitement when the remains of a decapitated woman were found during the 1943 visit, but she turned out to have been buried around 1300 years after the tomb was built. The Spanish galleon ship Nuestra Senora de Atocha was supposed to be a reliable trading vessel during the 17th century, but it proved to be anything but. She needed two sets of repairs performed before she was able to depart Cuba on her first ever voyage in 1620, and she didn't survive for very long. She made it to her native Spain and set off on a return trip to Colombia and back. She got to Colombia but never completed the return leg. Having made the ill-advised decision to sail past the coast of Florida during the hurricane season in 1622, she hit a squall and sank, taking her treasures with her. It wasn't until 1985 that she was found again by Mel Fisher, and all her treasures were still on board. Now, some of those treasures have been given up for auction, including the beautiful Atocha Emerald, which prestigious auction house Sotheby's estimates to have a value of around a quarter of a million dollars on its own. That's just one of the dozens of precious items that came out of the water, including a beautiful gold and emerald ring with a rectangular cut stone that was found in 2011, and a single gold coin worth $100,000. This final artifact needs no introduction. You'll recognize it immediately. It's the Golden Death Mask of Tutankhamun, the famous boy pharaoh of ancient Egypt. It's one of the most famous archaeological artifacts in the world. But forget what you think you know about it, because we're about to change your mind. The iconic mask was first found a century ago, when Howard Carter broke open the young pharaoh's tomb. What's new about the mask is a theory that says it may not have been made for Tutankhamun at all. 
Instead, it might actually have been designed for his mother, Nefertiti. The theory comes from British Egyptologist Nicholas Reeves, who studied the 3,300-year-old object and the era that it came from for much of his professional career. He has substantial evidence to back up his claims. He's been able to demonstrate that an inscription on the mask, which dedicates it to Tutankhamun, has been carved over the top of an older set of hieroglyphs, which translates as living manifestation of the sun god, beloved of Akhenaten, beauty of beauties, disk of the sun. The gushing description has been found on many other artifacts associated with Nefertiti, but never before on anything belonging to Tutankhamun. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.